Was Richard Wagner a psychopath? This is video number two of this series. If you want to catch up, watch part one. All right, so listen. In the world of music, not all is as it seems. And that's in contemporary times, that's today. I wonder how long it's been like this. We can say for sure it's at least as far back as the Beatles. If you look into the Beatles, all is not as it seems. There's even some suggestion that Paul McCartney died in a car crash in the 60s and was replaced by a, a double, a competition winner that was a double that became the new Paul McCartney. So, so just briefly on the Beatles. So, so like there's this idea that I'm exploring right now about whether whether Wagner's music was authentically his. I'm not saying that it wasn't, I'm just saying let's, let's make a comparison of the Beatles with Wagner. And let's also have a look at Mozart. Just briefly, Mozart, very famous as a, like a, a, a child prodigy, child genius. Mozart, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. For example, the, 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 the melody in, I think it's The Magic Flute, which is one of Mozart's best concertos. <clears throat> the Magic Flute. That melody predates Mozart. Somebody else came up with the melody first. The beauty of Mozart's Magic Flute. Somebody else came up with that melody first. And believe it or not, it wasn't even a, a fully white composer. <clears throat> there was a, in the French controlled territories somewhere, somewhere in like the Caribbean or somewhere, some island in the tropics somewhere, there was a, uh, a mostly black composer that is known to have come up with this melody first in his classical music. And then Mozart came up with a suspiciously similar sounding song. Mozart's song is better than, than the original, than the, the black composer's song. But the black composer's song is unmistakably the same as Mozart's song in, in melody. And the black composer's uh, song predates Mozart's song. It's almost like Mozart was given this melody and said, here, work on this. And you know what? There's something up in the air up there that's colored. I don't know what it is. That's very curious. What the hell could that be? We got a UFO up there. Is it a helium balloon or something? Or is it a parachute? It's a parachute or a paraglider or a paramotor perhaps. It could be a paraglider or a paramotor. Perhaps there's another one in the distance. I might have to stop and have a good look as I get closer. I'm always interested in sport aviation in Australia. I swear there's another one up there in the sky. Yeah, there is. They're probably parachutists, but maybe they're paramotors. There's two of them over there and there's one of them here. Parachutists or paramotors? or paragliders. I've got three of them in the sky up there in total. That's very interesting indeed. What are they doing? You almost, you almost see almost no sport aviation in Australia at all. It's really sad. It's really sad. Uh, one thing I've been looking for is I've been, I've been looking high and low for sport aviation airfields in Australia. There's hardly any. There's hardly any. There's hardly any. That's a parachutist. Okay, so they've done some skydiving. They must be gonna land over there in the farmer's fields or something. 
parachuting. I was hoping that it would be a paraglider, but no, it's a parachute. It's too short and it's got a trailing small parachute. Uh, yeah, I'm always, you know, I mean, back in, back in the olden days, there was more sport aviation in Australia than there is now. You know, you drive past a farmer's field in the 1940s and there'd be a tiger moth in there doing joy flights. And you'd pay a little bit of money and you'd go for a joy flight in the tiger moth. Maybe even do some aerobatics. You can't do that in Australia anymore because it's, it's all been legislated out of existence. There's no, there's no innovation allowed in sport aviation. All right, let's get back on to, we're talking about Mozart. So there's significant evidence that Mozart somewhat plagiarized a melody from a previous composer that was of all things black, um, like French, French tropical, French island composer. Like, you know, a quarter black or half black or something like that. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I myself, I'm like a, I'm a European-centric kind of a person. I don't like to point that out, that Mozart's melody predates Mozart and that it's from someone that's not European. I don't like to, to say that, but that's what, that's what the, the history shows us. So, and the plot thickens a bit more, doesn't it? Because uh, I just saw a bikey get pulled over by the cops. I don't think it was a real bikey, though. I think it was like one of these clubs that has Harley Davidsons and they dress up like bikies, but they're not organised crime, most likely, but who knows? Yeah, so... The plot does thicken with... We're going to talk about Wagner, but right now we're setting some context with Mozart and the Beatles. Don't forget that Wagner was a Freemason. Even when he was seven, in his 70s, he's, standing, he's sitting there in his uh, portrait with his wife Cosima, Cosima List, and he's got his hand in his jacket pocket, and he, he's got his hand in his coat indicating that he's a Freemason. That thing that Stalin does and that Napoleon does and Wagner does it too, it says, I'm a Freemason. That's what Wagner is signalling by that hand gesture. And so guess what? Mozart too was a Freemason. Mozart's dad was a Freemason. Mozart was a Freemason. So we have this child genius, child prodigy. And this is not a video about Freemasons. This is a video about was Richard Wagner a psychopath? But we're going to study some stuff and we're going to tie it all together because that's how you investigate things. That's how you do science. Mozart, child prodigy, was composing songs since he was like, you know, bloody eight years old or something. Oh, he's such a genius. Ah, but his dad was a Freemason. Freemasons are a hierarchical organization overrepresented, jam-packed full of narcissists and psychopaths because it's a power-centric organization. It focuses on power, and we know that narcissists and psychopaths are focused on power. They're naturally inclined towards power. They're fascinated with power. They know every trick in the book about power. They're all about power. Narcissists and psychopaths are all about power. And remember, they cannot love. They can't love, and they're obsessed with power, and they're, they're naturally having all of the machine-like functions, uh, you could call them skills, but they're more like a machine with several functions that are to do with power. Getting power, maintaining power, taking power. This is the, this is the interest of uh, narcissists and psychopaths, and the Freemasons are an organization indisputably in power. I have to demonstrate to you that there is a strong affinity, correlation, connection, association between narcissists and psychopaths who are power seekers and the Freemasons who are not only power seekers but actually in power over the entire world. It is said that narcissists and psychopaths are the children of the devil and it is said that Freemasons worship the devil. Freemasons and narcissists and psychopaths 
go hand in hand, like a hand and a glove. They fit together so very well. Freemasonry is a hierarchical secret society. That means that the members follow orders. Members of the Freemasons are members for life. Members for life. Once it's like it's like joining the mob or the FBI, the mob or the CIA or something. Once you join, you, you join for life. You can't leave. You can't ever fully leave. You can't leave the mob, can you? Once you join the Freemasons, you're basically a Freemason for life or you're obligated to them. You've taken an oath and you're obligated to them pretty much for life. And as I said, they're a hierarchical organization and that means following orders, just like in a military, just like in the mob. Everyone in these hierarchical organizations follows orders and takes oaths. Freemasons follow the orders of the one above them and that's it. They don't ask questions, they follow orders, they carry out orders. So that's the Freemasons, highly psychopathic, highly narcissistic, highly power focused and highly in power, very rich, very politically powerful in the world. And then you've got Wagner, Wagner is a Freemason, Mozart is a Freemason. We know that the Beatles, just to touch on that for a tick, the Beatles has a connection with Tavistock Institute in the United Kingdom uh, and Theodore Adorno, who was a professor of music theory. We know that some of the melodies and so on in the Beatles, I mean, the Beatles do fabulous songs. Some of the stuff in the Beatles songs is not from the Beatles. The Beatles are presented to you as these as these likely lads from Liverpool that are just so like innocent and everything. They're just, just three lads from Liverpool. Some of the uh, melodies and so on out of the Beatles songs come from such disparate places as um, Italian opera. Italian opera, like, like lifted, plagiarized, taken out of Italian, take an amazing melody out of an Italian opera and put it into a Beatles rock and roll song. You didn't know that, did you? We're not talking about an approximation, we're talking about plagiarism. Taking the melody out of the song and putting it in the Beatles song. Where does this come from? It comes from music theorist Theodore Adorno. There's basically a body of knowledge that's being built up that points to the Beatles being the first boy band, which is a manufactured band. It's a product made by music producers and, and marketing strategists and so on. Uh, Tavistock Institute's whole reason for existence is to control the minds of the entire uh, population of the, of the world, all of the human beings' minds. And they do various things to try and control people's minds. Currently, uh, Tavistock Institute is heavily involved in promoting um, gender reassignment, sex change, transsexualism, all of this kind of stuff. Back in the 60s, they were promoting the Beatles from what I can tell, and that they, the Beatles, Theodore Adorno and Tavistock were all sort of mixed up together. And their music label was called Apple as well, which is interesting. The, the forbidden fruit, right? That Eve, Eve ate the fruit in the, in the um, Garden of Eden. So, so what, what I'm trying to establish here is that it's not just three likely lads from Liverpool that came up with some amazing rifts in like Michelle My Bell or, or um, Strawberry Fields Forever or something like that. It's not just the, it's not the genius of the quiet one, George Harrison. There's a great deal of, I'll just say it, there's a great deal of evidence that points to the Beatles being given certain things. And then basically, like, basically not really writing their own songs, being given uh, melodies and songs and so on to work with um, from such uh, unlikely sources as music professor Theodore Adorno. Like Theodore Adorno, it studies music, studies how music impacts people, how it affects people, how it can uh, impact people's moods and feelings and so on. And then Tavistock, 
gives the Beatles these melodies and so on and says, here, make a song <coughs> about something. First, we'll start you off with something real lovey-dovey like um, I love you eight days a week or something, something really lovey-dovey. And then we're going to transition it to um, euphemistically uh, describing um, drug use in the song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, LSD. We're going to euphemistically start populating to the, to the public about drug use, psychedelic drug use. We're going to grow our hair even longer. We're going to go to India and start playing the sitar. We're going to in introduce Eastern mysticism, Eastern religion. So we're going, to, we're going to challenge Christianity. We're going to get people using psychedelic drugs. So the Beatles took their listeners on this massive journey from lovey-dovey, wearing suits with fairly conservative haircuts to like long hair, psychedelic drug use, going to India to smoke dope and play the sitar. This, the Beatles took their, captured their audience and then took them on a wild journey into chaos. And that's, that's the boomer generation. They were corrupted by such sources as Tavistock Institute via the Beatles. This is a short example to you of how music can be used by power structures to influence people's minds and to achieve cultural outcomes. Just like Tavistock tries to do. They try and achieve cultural outcomes. They try and change the culture. And not in a good way. Not in a good way. Not for the benefit of the people in the culture. For such goals as breaking down marriage, breaking down every classic thing that we know to be normal in our society, breaking it down and then dismantling it and getting rid of it. Until finally there's no support structures left for the human race and humans just cease to exist. This is the ultimate goal of uh, entities like Tavistock. And Beatles were a product of Tavistock. So you can bet your bottom dollar, again, not that this is a video about Freemasons, but you can bet your bottom dollar that there are a shit ton of Freemasons involved in Tavistock. Tavistock has their finger in a lot of pies, uh, including the, the Port Arthur 1996 mass shooting that led to the banning of a lot of guns in Australia. Uh, there's a Tavistock link to that as well. What a surprise, down in little old Tasmania, out in the middle of nowhere, big UK Tavistock Institute has a direct link to that shooting in Tasmania. All right, so we've got like um, we've got like Mozart. His dad's in the Freemasons. It's a hierarchical, psychopathic, power-seeking organization where its members follow orders without question from those above them in the power hierarchy. Mozart's born into this. Suddenly, Mozart's put forth as a, as a genius. Was he a real genius or was he a manufactured genius? We know that one of his melodies. I'm pretty damn sure it was the Magic Flute predates Mozart. So before Mozart was born, someone had already made a composed uh, a classical music song uh, that has that melody. And then Mozart comes along, born into Freemasonry, and voila, Mozart has a, a beautiful song with the same melody. You know, we can see this again with the Beatles. They've got like some line out of Nesson Dorma or some melody out of one of these Italian operas. It's just freaking copied. <clears throat> just copied a lot of stuff in the Beatles you'll notice that one of the beauties of the Beatles music is that it hits you in the in the feels it pulls your heartstrings Beatles music pulls your heartstrings the melodies in Beatles music gets you feeling a certain way and then when they overlay the themes and the lyrics onto the onto the melodies you get feelings associated with the concepts, themes, and ideas that they're putting into the lyrics. They could put any concepts, ideas, and themes into the lyrics. Anything at all. Anything at all. Ice cream, cats, casual sex, abortion. Eastern, Eastern religion, Hinduism, Satanism. Anything that they want. They can put lyrics and then they can set it to some highly emotive melodies and get you feeling strong emotions because of those melodies and associating them with those lyrics. 
And if they get you when you're a teenager with those lyrics and those melodies, they've got you, they've captured you. There is a science to influencing people through music and that's what Theodore Adorno was all about. And that's what Tavistock was using the Beatles for. And so then we go back to Mozart. Mozart's put forward as his uh, child prodigy and all this kind of stuff. We do know something about Mozart is that he was like, um, I don't know, like he was, he was writing rude jokes to his sister in letters, like potty, potty humor and stuff. That doesn't really sound like a genius to me. It's, it just sounds like, like, it's possible that Mozart was a synthetic genius, like a product of Freemasonry, put forth to create certain um, beautiful songs to get people that Freemasonry always has a desired outcome when it does things. It always has a strategic plan and it's always satanic in, in mind. You might say, well, how could such beautiful music be the result of Satanism? Whatever, whatever was the goal at the time, whatever was the objective at the time that they were working towards, they may well have uh, manufactured Mozart to put forth those melodies, those harmonies, those... It's quite possible that Mozart didn't compose that music, that it came from somewhere else. We, we do know that, at least in one example. And there's parallels between Mozart and the Beatles, okay? So now that I've sort of talked about that quite a bit, let's just have a look at Wagner. Wagner, lo and behold, Wagner was a Freemason too. And we're asking, was Wagner a psychopath? So I've looked on the internet and so have other people before me. I see they've searched for it. And there's a lot of like chat board stuff on the internet saying, look, I've searched for Wagner and Freemasonry. There's not much information out there. So a lot of people are sort of saying, oh, Wagner, yeah, you know, he was going to join, but they didn't let him join. <laughs> Listen, List, Franz List, was a Freemason and Wagner married Franz Liszt's daughter Cosima Liszt who became Cosima Wagner. Franz Liszt was a Freemason. It is said that on the internet it is said that Wagner joined the same Freemason lodge as Liszt, as Franz Liszt. If, if you know, there, there's you know, sort of semi-official histories on the internet asserting that Wagner got rejected from being a Freemason. They're saying that he was always really interested in being a Freemason, but he got rejected from it. Well, I mean, I can see photos of Wagner young and, all, young and old and paintings of Wagner young and old where he's doing Freemason uh, hand-in-coat gestures, just like Napoleon the Freemason, just like Stalin the Freemason. Even when Wagner was photographed when he was about 75 years old with Cosima, he's got his hand in coat Freemason gesture that he's posing for in the camera for the photograph. So I, I, I think if Wagner's constantly doing the Freemason gesture, I think that means that he's a freaking lifelong Freemason, don't you? So that we're not told any information about Wagner being a Freemason, to me that's fishy. Don't forget there was at least one other kind of German genius so-called so back then that was also a Freemason, which was um, Nietzsche. Wasn't Nietzsche a Freemason as well? And, and wasn't Nietzsche, um, you know, I, I like Nietzsche. I, like, I love Wagner and I love Nietzsche, but I'm just, I'm exploring my heroes here to see if they're really as good as, as I think they are, or if actually they're bloody Satanists. It's, it's important to, you know that saying, never meet your heroes? One time, a, one time a psychopath said to me, once I'd figured out who they were, they said to me, therefore, never met your hero. Therefore, never met your hero. English is a second language. Therefore, never meet your hero. You, you idolize someone. They're so genius. They're so brilliant. And then you get to know them and you're like, oh, fuck, it's a fucking psychopath. It's a psychopath. So was Wagner a psychopath? Well, he was a Freemason. That's a pro-psychopath, pro-power organization that has goals in common, objectives in common with psychopaths, namely the acquisition of power and the, and, and the, um, the manifesting of evil in the world. But how could someone who wrote such beautiful music possibly be evil? 
same as the Beatles, right? Beatles wrote, allegedly wrote such beautiful music. All that resulted in really was the boomer generation, lots of bad problems, birth out of wedlock, uh, composite families with half brothers and half sisters, abortion. Since that era of the Beatles, there's been more people killed by abortion every year than uh, worldwide than died in the entire of six years of World War II. They say that 50 million people died in World War II in six years. It is said that there's 50 million abortions worldwide every year. This is a result of freeing up of morality, freeing up of social constraints. And one of the ways that consent was manufactured for freeing up of, of uh, those constraints was to get people taking psychedelic drugs, to get people listening to these beautiful melodies of the Beatles and then presenting them with um, alternative religions. So suddenly it's not all just about Christianity. There's a pluralism now. There's more than one religion. You don't even have to be religious. You can just forget all about it. And religion was one of the structures of, of our traditional society. So the whole thing is deconstructivist to traditional society. I, I mean, I can see Nietzsche being useful, maybe. I'm not saying I'm thinking this. I'm just thinking out loud, speculating. Nietzsche could have been useful in the years leading up to World War I to get people to become atheistic so that they'd be willing to be just like, oh, well, human life doesn't matter. Therefore, a huge war. I'm not saying I'm saying that. I'm just, I'm just exploring some ideas here. I'm exploring the idea that these geniuses that give us these ideas may well, because they're Freemasons, be told in their hierarchical structure, told, ordered, you will do this. You will play this role. Freemasons, isn't it that they say the whole world is a stage? The whole world is a stage for Freemasons to play a, an, an acting role. And so many of them are psychopaths. And Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche was a Freemason. Was he told to play a role? Was his work really his? Was he just given stuff by his higher ups and said, here, this is you. For your whole life, this is you, this is your work. Go forth and be Nietzsche. Same, same with Wagner. Was Wagner told, hey, look, you've got some great talent. Let's use you. Let's give you some melodies. Let's give you some promotion. I mean, Wagner was involved in all sorts of crazy stuff. He was involved in revolutions like violent, highly illegal, treasonous revolutions and things like that. One of the reasons why Richard Wagner spent so much of his life living in Switzerland, which is like a neutral country, is because he kept on getting involved in uprisings and rebellions and revolutions, as it, it, and he was a Freemason, uh, in, in um, you know, German-speaking uh, uh, kingdoms uh, at the time. And uh, these revolutions sometimes failed, and then because they failed, he was on the run and he had to escape somewhere, so he went to Switzerland. A lot of Wagner's life was spent living in Switzerland, even though he's German, because he was basically exiled from the German kingdoms where he was because he was trying to freaking overthrow the government there. A highly treasonous thing to do. So Wagner is already breaking the law. He's involved in high treason uh, in his involvement in overthrowing, uh, overthrowing governments. There was some line from Wagner that he didn't like an opera house in a city. He said it was too small. And they refused, you know, the municipality or whatever, they refused to um, build the opera house bigger. And it's alleged that Wagner burnt the opera house down. He wanted a bigger opera house. They wouldn't build a bigger opera house. So he, uh, he allegedly burnt the, burnt the opera house down. It's not big enough, burn it down. How much of Wagner is actually just one guy self-directed and how much of him is actually like a manufactured synthetic character of the Freemasons? It's a guy that's told, these are your orders for you to follow for the rest of your life. This is your role to play in society, like Mozart, like the Beatles. <clears throat> All is not as it seems. And so, 
Most people don't want to believe that evil could be behind beautiful music like Wagner's music. I mean, listen, didn't Wagner's music sort of like sow the, sow the field or lay the groundwork or build the foundation for National Socialism in Germany in the 30s, 20s and 40s? Could it have happened without Wagner? Wagner was, you know, like this big inspiration for Hitler, right? So if you want Hitler in the 20s onwards, maybe you need Wagner in the late 1800s. Think about that. If you want Hitler in the 20s, 30s and 40s, maybe you need Nietzsche in the late 1800s. Nietzsche, Freemason, late 1800s. Wagner, Freemason, late 1800s. Hitler, 1920s onwards, based on Nietzsche, based on Wagner. If you want a world war in 1939, maybe you need Nietzsche in Wagner in mid to late 1800s. Something to think about. Something to think about. So like Freemasons at the, at the top end work in these grand uh, chessboard kind of moves, these grand strategies that are longer than a human life. And they have individuals working all their life towards the, it's called the great, there's a name for it. The Freemasons call it the great work, the great work. And the great work is what they're working towards. I think it's basically to wipe out humanity and replace humanity with a slave race. That's where all the autism comes in and everything. And throughout history, they've had really talented people working for them. Listen, if Wagner was a Freemason, that's not like a tiddlywinks club. That's not like a stamp collecting club. That's like a hierarchical um, shit stirring organization, like a military organization, like an organized crime gang. And if Wagner's in the Freemasons, he's working for them. Most of the kings of Europe including the British for sure, Freemasons. Wagner hanging around with rich people, bankers, merchants, silk merchants. So like I was, I was positing this idea that maybe Wagner was hanging around with rich men and um, sleeping with their wives so that if the rich men, you know, divorced or died or something, Wagner would suddenly land a lot of money if he married the wife of a, of a rich man or, you know, something like that. He might well have been positioning himself to get hold of somebody else's money with all of, with all of his interest in, in all of these females of other men. Like, for example, that, that um, Wiesendonk girl, there's uh, paintings of her where she looks pretty. She was supposed to be the muse or the, or the secret girlfriend of Wagner. Wiesendonk, Matilda Wiesendonk, in the paintings of her, she looks pretty. But this was the late 1800s when they were starting to get photographs. And you see the photographs of Matilda Wiesendonk. She doesn't look that great. She, I mean, you know, she's, you know all, all women are beautiful, but I'm just saying like the, the oil paintings of Matilda Wiesendonk uh, idealized they're making her look more it's like a filter on it's like a fil a selfie filter on facebook to make a woman look like she doesn't have wrinkles or something right oil paintings back then the artist would beautify the woman and make her look more beautiful than she actually looked and then you see the photographs of matilda wiesendonk so you know if wagner if, if wagner was obsessed with matilda wiesendonk Usually obsession like that is because of beauty. Well, she wasn't that beautiful. So why was he obsessed with her? Maybe because her husband was a silk merchant and Wagner lived in the, in like the visitor's house of M Matilda Wiesendonk's husband on their mansion property. You should see their mansion. Like there's modern day photos of the Wiesendonk mansion. It's the most beautiful, sublime building you've ever seen. It's so beautiful, beautiful building, beautiful gardens. Maybe Wagner just wanted to... Um, parlay his way into that Wiesendonk wealth and, and maybe he was doing that all over the place with all sorts of women and all sorts of friendships and, and deals and associations with, with rich men that you know were merchants and captains of industry and stuff like that you know Wagner seems to be a power seeking individual it's very suspicious that there's no real Freemason history information about Wagner on the internet it's very suspicious 
It's like it's been scrubbed from the internet. Of all the amazing stuff you can find on the internet, trying to find out about Wagner's Freemason history, there, there's practically nothing there. There's practically nothing there. So we've got a lot of different moving parts in this. We've got Hitler being in, ex, inspired by Freemason Wagner and Freemason Nietzsche. And then, and then we've got World War II. It is said that, I mean, it is known that the Freemasons created World War I, World War II, and that they're gonna create World War III. How do we know this? Because of Albert Pike. Because of Albert Pike. Albert Pike was an American Civil War general on the uh, Confederate side, and when the Confederacy lost the American Civil War, strangely enough, in Washington, D.C., home of the Yankees, a statue of Albert Pike was erected there. What on earth is Washington, D.C. doing erecting a statue of a Confederate Civil War general in Washington? Why are they doing that? That's an enemy of the, of the um, Yankees. That's an enemy of the Union. What are they doing portraying their enemy, a general of their enemy side, as like some person to idolize, building a statue of them in, in their capital city, no less? What are they doing? It's because, it's because Albert Pike was a 33rd degree Freemason. <coughs> Albert Pike, mentioned it, he, was, you know, he was in the Civil War uh, in that era. Albert, long before World War I, II, and soon to be three. Albert Pike had already forecasted World War I and how it was going to be, World War II and how it was going to be, and World War III and how it was going to be. And we've already had World War I and World War II, and they've turned out just as Albert Pike said, and now World War III is on the cards. So the Freemasons have this history of creating world events that are catastrophic and evil and disgusting, mega death of World War I, World War II and so on, and World War III. And then we've got Wagner is a Freemason. So every, especially the talented ones like Wagner and Nietzsche, every man that's a Freemason, that's talented, that's connected to, to, to kings and queens and wealthy businessmen, silk merchants and that, every one like that, they're usually part of the great work. They're usually part of the plan. And I mean, I just don't think they have empathic people doing those kind of things. They have psychopaths doing those kind of things. And again, people are, this is what I'm trying to say, people are struggling to, to, to conceptualize this notion that how possibly could an evil person create such beautiful music? Well, maybe they had their, their music wizards back then, their music scientists back then that knew just how to pull people's heartstrings. And uh, maybe Nietzsche was, you know, acknowledged to be a talented Freemason and given the brief to, um, to advance uh, atheism, for example. Uh, Albert Pike talks a lot about atheism. Maybe, um, like, the promotion of atheism. May wouldn't Nietzsche make a great promoter of, of, of atheism? If the Freemasons have an agenda of atheism, to spread atheism, to get everybody happy and uh, interested in atheism, maybe, maybe they, ta they gave the order, they tasked Nietzsche with, there's like, hey, for the rest of your life, you're gonna promote in your works, in your philosophy, you're gonna promote atheism, and then we're gonna disseminate, we're gonna publish your philosophy of atheism. Hey Wagner, we're going to get you to promote uh, German nationalism. Every single thing possible to promote German nationalism, <coughs> including participation in revolutions, that you have to flee in exile to Switzerland. All your music is going to promote German nationalism. And then, unbeknownst to Wagner, long after he's dead, 1914 and, and 1939 come along, and all the intervening years, and suddenly we've got German nationalism, we've got Wagner, We've laid the groundwork for this German nationalism to end up in mega death across Europe in World War II and World War I. You see how this kind of thing weaves throughout the, the decades. It's longer than a human lifespan. People like Wagner and Nietzsche and Mozart and the Beatles, they fit right into this kind of tapestry. They fit right into the great work. If you're a high-end Freemason like Wagner, Nietzsche, Mozart, guaranteed you're going to be involved in the great work. 
it may not be immediately obvious to you how Mozart was involved in the great work, but they would have had him doing something. And his death was interesting as well. Freemasons often die young and they often bring in family curses. Uh, uh, my great grandfather was a Freemason and he was the boss of one of Australia's biggest banks. And I'm pretty certain that he introduced a family curse into my family because ever since him the family has fallen apart and it's fallen into chaos. It's just my family's gone nuts. My family was at the top of Australian society a few generations ago. Then this Freemason banker and then and he died young. I was just saying Mozart died young, etc. He died young. He would have been, I don't know, like you know, like 58 or something when he died. So rich man, banker, Freemason died young and his son died as well in the war flying a flying a fight a fighter aircraft a, a fighter bomber a Lockheed Hudson against the Japanese from around the time of Pearl Harbor for about three months a, a battle raged in uh, Southeast Asia he was part of that battle against the Japanese and he died on the second last day of the battle so yeah, there's quite possibly a family curse on my family that I'll, I'll need to try and lift it somehow, break the break break the curse. The Freemason gets wealth and success, but then their generations afterwards suffer for it. It's a it's a Faustian deal that the later generations pay for. So I don't trust Wagner. After I've just discussed this with you, I don't trust him. I see him as really opportunistic and really power seeking. These are cl cluster B characteristics of a psychopath. Psychopaths are often gifted with genius and Wagner was a genius. But you know, knowing what we know about Mozart and not all of his music was his, knowing what we know about the Beatles and not all of their music was theirs and they had the Theodore Adorno connection and the Tavistock connection about psychological warfare through Tavistock. Theodore Adorno learning how to pull people's heartstrings with music, getting them feeling feelings and then overlaying any lyrics that you want onto those feelings that they're feeling. Imagine if I, as, as Theodore Adorno, get you feeling loving feelings and then I hit you with songs about just subtle little things that are going to shift a generation ever so slightly like you know Christianity you know it's it's not really the main thing now we've got Hinduism we've got sitars we've got dope smoking a long hair maybe that was that was for sure one of the goals but you know of, of Tavistock you know about the baby boom generation you know about the generations before them were so different to the baby boomers baby boomers were so different because they were subjected to massive mind control by such organizations as Tavistock, Theodore Adorno, the Beatles, and so on and so forth. This is mind control. This is altering, shifting, changing the attitudes and values of the public. And voila, you get the degeneracy. You get the degeneracy of the baby boomer generation. And then the, the subsequent generations are at least as degenerate, if not more so, usually more so. They keep moving the, de the degeneracy more and more extreme. <sighs> to the point that in my generation, I mean, I'm not married because I haven't found the right girl that's interested in me, uh, but there's plenty of people that are attractive enough to get married and they don't get married because my generation has foregone marriage. They've rejected marriage. They reject marriage. This is a degenerate thing to do. And this is because of the freeing up of attitudes and values and cultural norms through such things as 1960s Beatles music via Theodore Adorno and Tavistock. And so music and the Freemasons are linked uh, and mind control is done through music in a big way, especially before television, you know. And so you've got, you've got Mozart, you've got the link there, he's a Freemason, he's, he's using someone else's music that was making that music before Mozart was even born. Uh, you've got Nietzsche, Freemason, encouraging people to be atheistic. Um, then, you, then you've got you know, World War I later on. 
You've got Wagner doing all of his nationalism stuff. You can't have a war without intense nationalism, can you? I know that Nietzsche was saying, oh, nationalism's so bad, but he was also promoting atheism. And then you've got Wagner and he's... Wagner's also, in a way, promoting atheism and promoting Freemasonry, in a way. Parsifal has Freemasonic kind of rituals in it, even though it's about the quest for the Holy Grail, which is a Christian concept. But like Tristan and his older, for example, Wagner's best uh, opera, there, there's no Christianity in that opera, for example. So there doesn't have to be, but, you know, I mean... Look at Renaissance era artwork. It was every single thing was dedicated to God, to, to Christ, to, to the Christian God. Every single artwork was glory to God in the Renaissance. You got this radical shift. Wagner and Nietzsche come along, both Freemasons. Suddenly it's all about atheism. Atheism, atheism, atheism. Changing society. So, yeah, listen, I personally have known psychopaths that are genius. They're genius. They're incredibly impressive. Their genius is amazing. They're so impressive. And a lot of people rail against this. They say, oh, no, no, that person's not a genius. because they're a psychopath. Like once someone hears that someone's a psychopath or they, they form the opinion that that person's a bad person, they'll reject the notion that that bad person can have a genius IQ because they don't want to associate something they perceive as good with something that, with, with, with a, bad, a person that they perceive as bad. So I'm here to tell you that bad people can have genius level IQs, without a doubt. And if that's the case, you shouldn't deny it because that's dishonest. We're not going to understand evil if we're continuously denying the characteristics and the traits of evil. And it just so happens that one of the traits and characteristics of psychopaths very often is a genius level or a very high IQ uh, intelligence. Very smart, very impressive. They're, they're, it's like the devil gifts its, his representatives on earth, the psychopaths, with extraordinary talent, extraordinary skill and ability champion sportsmen, champion music composers, champion this, champion that. And so many of them are Freemasons. There's just something fucky about Wagner. I love Wagner's music. I'm never going to stop loving Wagner's music. There's some, there's, there's some psychopaths and I've, you know, I've come to know that they're psychopaths. I, I'm still hot. If they're entertainers, they're highly entertaining. They're so effing funny. They're, they're, they could be a comedian, or they are a comedian. They could be, they're so funny. Psychopaths have such a great sense of humor. They're so funny. 